Uh, next up this morning, we're pleased to have Corinna Gore, the director of the Center for Earth Ethics at Union Theological Seminary in New York, here today to deliver our first keynote. And introducing her today will be Marion Gilliam. Marion Gilliam is the chairman and president of the Marin Institute, a private operating foundation, and the founding chairman of the Orion Society, which is the publisher of Orion Magazine. He was educated at the University of Louisville, the University of Zurich, and at the University of Paris. He is a director of the American Council for Drug Education at Phoenix House and a trustee of the Greenacre Foundation. Before I turn it over to Marion uh, this morning, I just wanted to read a passage from his farewell letter as publisher of Orion Magazine, which seemed apt uh, to me today. There, Marion wrote, quote, much has changed in the three decades since the magazine was launched and the matters with which Orion's early authors grappled appear humble when compared to the urgent challenges humanity faces today. Climate change, the population crisis, and the extreme methods of extracting the Earth's remaining resources dwarf the environmental issues that Orion addressed in 1982. Perhaps most alarming of all is a political and corporate culture that seems less and less interested in understanding the truth of what is happening in the world and less and less inclined to demand sane policy. <laughs> Please welcome Marion Gilliam. You know, it's so funny, I think I'm probably the only person who is introducing somebody that got an introduction. And so it made me think of when I was asked if I would do that, I knew that the Institute, Marin Institute, had helped underwrite the cost of this. Uh, so I figured that perhaps uh, Thomas just wanted to give some kind of recognition for a little bit of financial support. But the truth is, I've reflected on it, I realized that, in fact, the principles that the Institute and Orion have always uh, sort of been about are really trying to find a balance that many people referred, through, referred to as a kind of a threefold social order. And it really is the political order, the economic order, and the cultural order. And of course, by cultural order, we mean all the things that in particular, uh, Corinna has written about, spoken about in so many ways. But she also has this wonderful thing. Somewhere I hear, I will just read a little bit of this because I can't possibly remember it all. It's so impressive. Um, but um, I'll just begin by saying that her, her little bio says that she is an attorney, an advocate, a writer, an educator. She serves as a director and indeed a founding director of the Center for Earth Ethics. And her past experience includes work with legal issues, particularly that dealt with families, children, in areas of poverty where the children families are really prisons, prisoners of their situation. And then her work, of course, in uh, challenging uh, laws and regulations by civil disobedience, nonviolent civil disobedience, and reference was made earlier to date to some of the work in the pipelines out west and in the east. And if I'm not mistaken, you were arrested along with some of your colleagues and are facing trial soon in Boston to, I don't know, either keep you in jail, put you in jail, or whatever it may be, put you back in jail if you were arrested, I guess. But anyway, I think the great thing that I have found our last speakers addressing is, of course, championing, sad though it may be, it's not succeeded as much as we all would have liked, but the sort of sad situation that so many of our regulations and rules and laws have left us with where there are ways around them and, and uh, we still are abusing and, uh, and um, uh, extracting resources way beyond the, the, the Earth's ability to continue to supply them. But to my way of thinking, this piece of the puzzle that is the balance between this economic, political, and cultural component is what we were touching on at the end of the discussions, and that is the, the real change in the human from a soul and spiritual perspective. And I think that for all of the work and the dependence that we face and, and have made this country and all countries around the world great, that is the laws and the kind of rights of individuals in so many ways. But what has been missing in recent years is that soul quality that everyone that referred to the spotted owl pictures and the salamander pictures and the whatever, it touches something in us that I think is innate in our being. And I am pleased to say that as I begin to approach my octogenarian years, 
What impresses me most today, and particularly led by people like Karenna, but even younger, is this incredible awakening in young people to something that's greater and deeper and doesn't, isn't something that's taught. It's something that comes from an inner sense of feeling and maturity and, and you might say the evolution of, of our consciousness in our time. So uh, without any further ado, I, I was about to say, I could have gone on to say that there are many other um, books she's written, well, one book in particular. Uh, she's just completed an introduction to a book that's going to be published and released uh, by the end of the year, I think, that's based on the writings of Thomas Lindsay, which basically are the community rights papers that many of you have seen as they've appeared at different times in the last several years, and that's going to be in book form and, I guess, published at the end of the year. And Corinna very kindly wrote the introduction to that. Um, as the last name may suggest, I don't know whether she's um, uh, excited to have me say this or not, but uh, she is, of course, the, one of the daughters of Vice President Gore and his wife, Tepper, Tipper, and um, has worked uh, alongside him and certainly following in his footsteps so much in trying to um, speak to climate change issues. And I'm going to close my little introduction by way of saying, though I didn't have a chance really to talk to her about this because I just met her in person for the first time this morning, but I think she would say that as we talk about rights of nature, and we think, of course, rights of, of spotted owls, rights of trees, rights of oceans, and so on, but I think it's fair to say that what she speaks to in her references to climate change are climate rights, that climate has a right to be protected. And I don't know what she's going to have to say today, but I think she will inspire you to realize that this other component, this thing that we might call spiritual, something that comes out of the soul, is, is I think, the saving grace of what we need to have really emerge as a kind of counterbalance to the overwhelming control that the political and economic components of our social order are in league uh, with and, and work against uh, our a real uh, freedom and, um, and happiness that our Constitution guarantees to us. So without anything further, Corinna, I offer to our guests here your presence. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Marion, for that very gracious introduction. Thank you to the organizers, CELDEF and the Tulane Law School. I uh, am very grateful for the honor of speaking here. And I'm delighted to be back in New Orleans, uh, especially so close to Halloween. Um, I have always had mixed feelings about Halloween, actually, and this is all the more true since I've become a parent. Um, as with so many things, it seems like it hit just every year it gets more and more commercialized. And I actually looked up and found that there is a study that, that keeps track, and it says this year Americans will spend $7.4 billion on candy, costume, and, and costumes and decorations combined. Um, but do you remember when we just made our own? Um, it seems like it went so quickly that, that things changed in this way. Um, on the other hand, Halloween does bring a very worthy suggestion traceable to its origins that we should, at least for one day, take time to contemplate the dead. Where better in the United States uh, for such contemplation than here in New Orleans with your robust sense of <coughs> esoteric spiritual traditions, jazz funerals, elevated cemeteries, the creeping vines, and roots that come out of the sidewalks. More than anywhere I know, this is a city with a palpable sense that those who once walked the streets are not exactly gone. A feeling that they, and also we, are part of a long continuum. New Orleans doesn't bury its past under lots of mall developments and parking lots. It's right here for everyone to see. But why are we drawn to contemplate the past and those who have passed on? For one thing, right now, it seems painfully obvious that we have profoundly lost our way in this country. Our nation seems to be strangely obsessed with the most superficial aspects of our society, no matter how phony or fleeting. And now we're constantly prompted by the digital realm, the voracious algorithms controlling our 
engines of distraction, always selling us something or trying to shape our minds to prepare us to want whatever they think we are vulnerable to wanting. It has gotten to the point where we seem to have no time left over to focus on deeper conversations about who we are and what legacy we will leave for those who might, perhaps on some future Halloween, contemplate what we were thinking when we inhabited this world that we will bequeath to them. Now, more than ever in the past, it is time to seek wisdom and deeper understanding from all generations, not only from those in the past, but also from our contemplation of the generations to come. One of the best known teachings from Native American traditions that is always worth lifting up is the concept that every important decision made today should be made with a sense of how it will affect the next seven generations. And actually, that span of time is not as wide as it might seem. I knew my great-grandmother, and I hope to know my great-granddaughter. I already care about her. And I care about how I will answer some of the questions that she and her generation will inevitably ask. What exactly were we doing in 2017? Did we really care about the generations to come, or did we just pretend that we did? We need to deepen our sense of time living not just in the moment, but with a recognition of all who came before and will come after. The philosopher Stephen Gardner has, argue, has argued that what we all know as the tragedy of the commons is actually better understood as the tyranny of the contemporary. We also need to deepen our sense of place and cultivate an awareness that we are living not just in one community or one country, but on one earth the one and only that we and our great-grandchildren will ever have. And we need to deepen our sense of being, thinking not just about humans, but also about the rest of life on Earth, not just about human rights, but about the moral claims that inhere in nature. Despite the spell cast by our modern culture, we do not live in a self-enclosed, air-conditioned, bubble wrap, hermetically sealed reality designed to satisfy our impulses and desires. We inhabit this magnificent earth. And we need to be comfortable with language about non-human life that conveys ontology rather than just utility. So today, I'd like to talk to you about the rights of nature. This morning, we heard from distinguished experts about the limits of conventional environmental law, and we heard about so much else. I really learned a lot this morning. I'm very grateful um, to those panelists. I will try to, during my turn at the podium, focus on the larger context in which this discussion takes place and help to introduce this field known as the rights of nature, which is presently considered to be unconventional, but which makes far more sense than continuing on the present course. And if we change our definition of wealth, may even be the biggest source of wealth creation in human history. I also believe that we need an earth ethics to guide us as we explore this field. Ethics draws deep on moral values. They often, ethics often undergirds laws, but when laws are out of steps, ethics operate independently to argue for changing those laws. This is indeed such a time. That, by the way, explains the civil disobedience uh, that, uh, <laughs> that Marion was referring to. Um, why do we need to formally acknowledge the rights of nature? For one thing, nature is obviously speaking to us. I wouldn't say she is asking us to hear her. I would say rather she is demanding to be acknowledged and respected. And of course, here in New Orleans, one does not need to explain the impact of the voice of nature. In many ways, Hurricane Katrina in 2005 was a turning point in the awareness of what the impacts of global warming pollution will look like. And this community pulled together from the ground up making up for the transgressions from the top down. I also want to take a moment to applaud the city for the courage with which it has taken hold of its own cultural narrative. Last time I was a he here, about a year and a half ago or so, I spent a while walking around and I paused in Lee's circle to look, in the circle to look way up at the extraordinarily tall statue of Robert E. Lee. And then across at the handful of people sitting around the base of that monument. What an act of communal grace it was to take down that statue.
You chose to lift the veil of a perverse and persistent myth and embrace instead the much more interesting, colorful, and exciting possibilities that are in reality. As Mayor Landrieu said, you simply corrected a wrong turn to be more closely connected with the integrity of the founding principles of our nation. But let's also remember what William Barber says, Reverend William Barber. It's not just the statues, it's the statutes. We must reform our legal and political systems so they too reflect our values. So to begin the discussion of whether nature have rights, we should first ask the obvious question. Are, the right, are rights only properly assigned to people? If the answer to that is yes, then why do corporations have rights? We all know the Supreme Court's sleight of hand. Corporations are persons, they tell us, from the decision in Santa Clara versus Southern Pacific Railroad in 1886 to Citizens United in 2010. It is a lie, of course, and it's a lie written by lawyers for corporations. But leaving that aside, if a sleight of hand will, suffi will suffice to expand the definition of a person, then Mother Nature seems to be more worthy of the benefits of this artifice than, say, ExxonMobil or Coke Enterprises. In the effort to expand the definition of in the effort to expand the definition behind corporations, there's also an effort to accommodate the assignment of rights to entities other than human beings that has led now to the consideration of giving personhood to robots. In Estonia, the economic ministry is working on legislation that would address the status of artificial intelligence in legal disputes by creating the legal term robot agent. What they have in mind is something between property and a separate legal identity. But the point illustrated by these examples is that the law does not remain static. It incorporates, evolves, and changes based on society's values and needs. So why should we not evolve and change our conception of rights to incorporate the rights of nature? In fact, as has been already referenced, one of America's greatest legal minds proposed this idea not long ago, or actually quite a long time ago, depending on how you look at it. Justice William O. Douglas said in his famous dissent in Sierra Club versus Morton in 1972, contemporary public concern for protecting nature's ecological equilibrium should lead to the conferral of standing on environmental objects to sue for their own preservation. He went on to say that just as a corporation has legal standing, the river as plaintiff speaks for the ecological unit of life that is part of it. And he also specifically pointed out that the federal agencies charged with overseeing the regulatory law are notoriously under the control of powerful interests who manipulate them. The problem then, and much more so now, is that we are only bending our legal system in one direction to widen and pave the path that well-financed corporate litigants constantly urge us to take, a path that leads to the separation from nature. In the 21st century, we urgently need to open another legal path, a path that has been less taken, but that can make all the difference, a path toward harmony with nature. The history of this field is difficult to characterize because it draws on indigenous knowledge that has been deeply embedded in ancient and even some contemporary cultures, but it has also come to expression in academic and legal discourse in ways that are genuinely new to those arenas. Douglas's famous dissent was influenced by the work of a thinker mentioned earlier, American law professor Christopher Stone, whose piece called Should Trees Have Standing Towards Legal Rights for Natural Objects laid out some basic rationales for the rights of nature, which continue to hold up. Giving legal personality to nature would enable us to protect the world because it would lift up the harm to nature itself as the issue at hand, rather than derivative harm to human beings only. And then, accordingly, the remedies would apply to the entities in nature, ending the harm and also helping to restore it. He also situated this new form of jurisprudence in the context of other ways in which laws have developed alongside morals. For example, at one point in time in many societies, like Rome, children were property that could be bought, sold, or killed according to the father's will. But as cultures evolved, they have acknowledged that 
Children, even infants, have their own separate legal personality that makes them intrinsically worthy of protection. In the time of slavery, the murder of a slave was only legally considered as property damage to the slaveholder, not homicide. And in the same, in related ways, it has been true for women, especially as the history of domestic violence laws clearly shows. The widening of the circle of human rights and the root of this thought in the European Enlightenment is the unfolding story of truth and dignity and freedom from which we can draw inspiration. Of course, dehumanization is a real and vicious force that comes up too, which tells us something about the long journey for the protection of nature. The concept to the human right to the environment which is written into some state constitutions and is the subject of some initiatives right now being developed in Europe, is a positive development to protect nature, but it's also vulnerable to being mistaken as a mechanism for more equal opportunity to exploit resources. And we should remember also the most extreme human rights abuses today, among them are those against those who defend nature for its own sake in order to leave it undeveloped and often in the hands and in, in the habitat of indigenous communities. Some of these defenders dis even describe themselves as Mother Nature defending herself. The Guardian and Global Witness maintain a careful record of the extraordinary rate of assassinations of defenders of land or the environment. They estimate that 185 such people were killed in 2016 alone. So human rights are important, but we are talking about something different here, and we need to put humans in context. In 1948, the year of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the human population was about 2.4 billion. Today, there are about 7.6 billion people on Earth, and we will be about 11 to 12 billion by the end of the century. As hard as it is for us to count humans, it is nearly impossible for us to count other species, in part because we know that there are so many about which we know nothing. E.O. Wilson has estimated the number between 5 and 30 million. He also says this, the one process now going on that will take millions of years to correct is loss of genetic and species diversity by the destruction of natural habitats. This is the folly our descendants are least likely to forgive us. The process he is warning about is, of course, the ongoing massive loss of species that has been termed the sixth great extinction, and the first such wave of extinction caused primarily by human activity. It is important to note that this wave of extinction also threatens some of the plants and animals that make up global food supplies for humans. Biodiversity International published a report last month that analyzed the loss of agrobiodiversity. Right now, three quarters of the world's food comes from just 12 crops and five animal species. Pigs, cows, chickens, sheep, and goats. But there are also tens of thousands of wild or partially cultivated species that nourish human beings and are at risk from environmental destruction. Without acknowledgement and protection, these may be lost. Of course, we know about larger species on the endangered species list. They are called charismatic megafauna, apparently, such as elephants and wolves and whales. But we should also care about these other species, including the birds and bees and tiny life forms that connect the strands of, web, of the web of life that we do not yet fully understand. Yet one of the current features of our legal system is that we do not value species for their intrinsic worth until they are almost gone. By then, it is sometimes too late, especially if their essential habitat is too far gone, as E.O. Wilson's work teaches us. And even then, it seems to be a struggle for many people to justify any concern for their fate. Earlier this month, the writer Elizabeth Colbert gave a lecture on the fate of the earth in which she chose to look at that topic from the viewpoint of the millions and millions of non-human species with which we share the planet. 
She pointed out that our rapid reshuffling of the biosphere is one reason why so many scientists argue that we have entered into a new geological age, that we no longer live in the Holocene, but instead in the Anthropocene, because human activity has become the most powerful force in nature and is now radically ch changing the distribution, quality, and chemistry of life on Earth. And Colbert rightly framed the central issue this raises in terms of violence. When we burn coal and oil and gas, we are taking carbon that was sequestered in the course of hundreds of millions of years and throwing it back into the atmosphere in a matter of centuries, she wrote, or even decades as carbon dioxide. Ocean acidification looks to corals like chemical warfare. Let's also keep in mind the concept of slow violence that Coretta Scott King articulated as it affects all life forms, including our own. Another way to think about life on Earth is in terms of ecosystems, interconnected webs of life often sustained around and within geological entities like rivers, mountains, wetlands, forests, and oceans. The World Wildlife Fund estimates that about 46 to 58 square miles of forests are lost every year, which amounts to the loss of about 48 football fields every minute of every night and day. This not only means habitat loss, it is also the loss of a portion of the lung capacity of the planet necessary to turn carbon dioxide into oxygen. All types of ecosystems are threatened today, sometimes by agribusiness <coughs> seeking greater market share by seeking more land to raise some of the five animal species and 12 crops mentioned above. Sometimes by extractionist industries digging for more fossil fuel sources and other mineral wealth. And sometimes by other forms of what we are told to call economic development. A whole host of animate and inanimate materials that are considered natural resources are being depleted at a rate 1.5 times the pace that it would take for them to replenish. Both topsoil and underground fresh water aquifers are being depleted at a rate many times faster than either resource can ever be replenished and restored. A recent analysis by Global Footprint Network showed that if developing countries grow their economies as fast as many hope to, in an effort to catch up to the higher income countries, we would need 3.4 Earths to sustain humanity. This is assuming that the high income countries stop increasing their production and consumption rates, which if you have listened to any politicians recently, seems about as likely as us finding another 3.4 Earths for which uh, we might decamp. The main problem with our present way of thinking about poverty, wealth, and the economy is that it does not acknowledge the health of the biosphere itself the source of all true wealth, and does not assign to it the most basic right to exist that would confer standing to seek protection within our legal structure, a system that is designed to be responsive to rights-based appeals. Perhaps the clearest example of this is climate change. Despite the advent of cheaper, clean, renewable energy technologies, fossil fuels still produce 80% of the world's energy. We spew 110 million tons of global warming pollution into our atmosphere every 24 hours. And as many know, 16 of the 17 hottest years on record have occurred since 2001, fueling the heat waves, droughts, wildfires, and stronger storms that we have seen with increasing frequency and severity in recent years. Most of the heat energy ends up trapped in our oceans. In addition, Carbon dioxide emissions make the oceans more acidic, which affects all marine life and is especially harmful to infant marine life. Since the Industrial Revolution, the acidity of the oceans has increased by 26%. One current manifestation of this is the death of the coral reefs, reefs that Elizabeth Colbert referred to. Some call them underground rainforests. Half have been lost in the last 30 years, and some say 90% will be gone by the year 2050. In the Caribbean alone, close to 80% of the cor coral cover has disappeared. This is also an issue of waste. Plastics, for example, the result of the rapidly spreading culture of throwaway products and commercial wrapping and packaging, which you can also see as evidence of a form of economic growth. 
as it is currently measured, are fouling waterways all over the world. According to one calculation, the weight of all the plastic in the ocean will soon surpass the weight of all the fish. A recent analysis by The Guardian also concluded that every minute sees the piling up of one million plastic water bottles alone. Sometimes when I hear people trying to wake everyone up to this reality, I think of a joke. What is the difference between an optimist and a pessimist? The pessimist says, I can't imagine how things could get much worse. And the optimist says, oh, I think I can. <laughs> It is in large part because of all the harm that we are doing to the ecological system that there is an emergent basis for hope because there is an emerging consciousness. The consequent disruptions are causing harm to us. And there's a fast growing awareness that something has gone terribly wrong. Though many environmental activists have criticized the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement, both adopted in late 2015 as merely voluntary and woefully insufficient to meet the challenges at hand, and I actually want to take a moment and thank Richard Mott for the excellent history and analysis of these agreements that was very interesting and helpful. There have been encouraging signs in many nations in the aftermath of these 2015 agreements. Global CO2 emissions have stabilized for three years in a row. Deployments of renewable energy technologies appear to be growing rapidly. And many state, provincial, and municipal governments are pledging to convert to renewable energy at a must, much faster pace than we previously imagined. A significant number of businesses appear to be responding to the demand of their customers and other stakeholders to reduce their emissions and to examine their supply chains. The sum of all of these efforts is, of course, very far from what is truly needed, should not be mistaken for what is necessary, but at least it has given rise to hope and to the opportunity to look deeper at the systems at work in our world. I work at Union Theological Seminary, and in, the, in September of 2014, we had a big conference in conjunction with the United Nations Climate Summit and the People's Climate March, actually in thanks to funding from Wallace Global. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> it was called Religions for the Earth, and its goal was to reframe climate change as a moral issue and galvanize faith-based activism to fight, to fight it. On the day that our conference opened, an essay was published in the journal Science, co-authored by an economist and a climate scientist, that expressed the need for a deeper, deeper level of change. Here's what they said. Over and above the institutional reforms and policy changes that are required, they wrote, there is a need to reorient our attitude towards nature and thereby ourselves. This is, of course, precisely what the rights of nature can do. Our common language, especially words like climate and environment, are often inadequate and disappointing because they do portray this flat, inanimate view of nature and a separation of human beings. We know instead that nature has volition, agency, and personality. Indigenous traditions have always honored and wisely expressed and practiced this. Western civilization has largely relegated the moral and spiritual expression of this truth to artists, writers, musicians, and mystics, and has separated out and promoted the practical observations of it for what we know as science. Many have observed recently that science is aligned with indigenous wisdom in important ways in talking about climate change, and it is, in fact, a combination of those two streams of knowledge that we will need to measure the well-being of nature as we pursue the rights of nature. Of course, we are nature. We are in constant dependence on the biosphere. It's a matter of interrelationships and connections. The breath we inhale and exhale is hardly external to well-being, even if the air is called an externality for pollution purposes. Yet the sense of separation is really pervasive. 
One important example of this is that institutions have difficulty tracing health, human health impacts to environmental causes, even when they are quite direct. There are layers of powerful interests, of course, that stand in the way of making that connection. I read the other day about a Trump appointee in the EPA who went from being a top executive at, a chemical, at the chemical industry's main trade council to running the EPA's toxic chemical unit. And she is insisting on rewriting the rule to make it harder to trace the health effects of the chemical known as perfluorooctanoic acid, or PFOA, P -F -O -A, which is linked to kidney cancer, birth defects, immune disorders, and other serious health problems. The EPA's Office on Water has objected. But this woman argues that in this and related cases, the government should not be burden, burdening the private sector with a whole host of concerns that apparently are termed phantom risks. As we know, the White House has famously deleted references to climate change on their website as if we can press delete and make this problem go away. And the president's pick to run the White House Quality Council on Environmental Quality, I just read, has called in the past called concern about climate change a kind of paganism <laughs> for secular elites. So, what is going on here? Why are those who claim to speak up for the link and connection between humans and our environment being cast into the realm of phantoms and pagans? By the way, again, happy Halloween. <laughs> How did it come to be that we came to define issues involving water, soil, other living beings, and air as something totally separate from people? Part of this problem is theological. Many have interpreted their religious traditions to separate matter and spirit. This is particularly relevant in cultures such as ours in America, where the Christian religion came to prominence in tandem with the force of colonization. In the 15th century, when Europeans sailed to distant shores and the particular race to colonize and extract began here, the Vatican, specifically Pope Alexander VI, issued decrees, papal bulls they were called, proclaiming that the land and the peoples of the Americas and Africa should be conquered, vanquished, and subdued. All non-Christian flora and fauna, with non-Christian people being part of the flora and fauna, as defined in the papal bull. An astonishing degree of cruelty and contempt accompanied the dominance and settlement of these places. The legacy of all of the violence, genocide, and slavery still haunts our world and has not been adequately confronted. The contempt that I want to focus on today specifically was not only the contempt for the people who'd been living on these lands for many millennia, but also contempt for the way these peoples understood themselves to be interconnected to their local ecosystems. This is what my colleagues who run the original caretakers program at Union call biocultural heritage. And it is precisely this same contempt that is present when we dump pollutants into the air as if it were an open sewer, when we hack away at the earth and even the ocean floor in the name of economic growth, and when, the con when we define the concept of growth in ways that systemically exclude any consideration of the destruction or the connection to our own wealth, our own health <coughs> and well-being. This actually now even extends to blindness to economic qu consequences on, on even conventional terms because the lens now for those economic calculations is so, so short term that it doesn't even in, encompass the long term inevitable horrific monetary losses that are now coming pretty regularly. In other words, the spirit of the colonial conquest is very much alive in the way we are asked to think about our economy. Fifty years ago, in 1967, a medieval historian named Lynn White wrote a paper called The Roots of Our Ecological Crisis. 
in which he famously claimed that, quote, the victory of Christianity over paganism was the biggest psychic revolution in the history of our culture, and that the new belief system about land, which removed animistic beliefs and a sense of sacred and the physical, was what sowed the seeds for commodification of nature and widespread ecological destruction. This paper caused a lot of controversy. Many continue to push back on it. And there has been a lot of recent effort to retrieve and revive the ecological sensibility within the Judeo-Christian tradition, including reinterpretations of the Bible based on ancient Aramaic, Hebrew, and Greek translations, which are fascinating and important. Pope Francis has written an extraordinary encyclical, Laudato Si, on care for our common home, which is full of Christian theology about the intrinsic worth of nature and acknowledgments about, the, about a real right to the environment. One of my favorite lines in it is, the entire material universe speaks of God's love, his boundless affection for us. Soil, water, mountains, everything is, as it were, a caress of God. However, White did voice some important truths. The way that Christianity has been interpreted from medieval Europe to the age of colonization to the efforts in the 1950s in America to wed it to capitalism through moves like putting in God we trust on the money. There's a good book by Kevin Cruz on that history called In God We Trust to the contemporary expression of the prosperity gospel. Much of mainstream religion has contributed to the objectification and exploitation of nature. Emphasis on the afterlife doesn't help. Of course, this is combined with the legal history in which environmental law emerged from European common law and cast land as property. We know that the destruction of ecosystems is driven not only by the notion that nature is property, but also by the economic development model that is based on short-term monetary value, no matter how inequitable and no matter how destructive. Measurements like GDP are so flawed as to be perverse. GDP has four infamous flaws that are worth revisiting. It does not count so-called externalities like pollution, it does not count depletion of natural resources. It does not count positive things like investment in child care um, or health care, which will have long-term benefits. Those, those are counted as costs. And finally, it does not count inequality, the, the inequitable distribution of whatever the GDP may be. These systemic flaws in GDP and the prevailing business accounting systems that derive from it have long been known. And even the inventor of GDP, Simon Kuznets, was himself the first to call attention to it and begged people not to use it as a measure of success in society. Yet seven years after he first warned this against the use of it as a principal guide for economic policy, GDP was codified in the Bretton Woods Agreement of 1944, and it's still pervasive today. I bring this up today because the first two problems I mentioned with GDP are really problems about how we relate to nature. As we talk about the rights of nature, we must always contend with the fact that currently all of the natural world is viewed merely as a collection of resources. To paraphrase the great Thomas Berry, Berry all objects to be used in the service of one supreme subject, the economy. Berry taught that we should realize that the universe is a communion of subjects, not a collection of objects. Now, there are environmental laws, of course, as we, has heard, as we have heard. We've heard about many of the most important ones, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act. And these are Im really important achievements that certainly make a huge difference. I was part of a fight to stop a fracked gas pipeline going through my home state of New York. The only way we could prevail was through an administrative lever from the Clean Water Act, the state DEC denial of the water quality certificate. This was actually one portion of a pipeline, the Constitution Pipeline in New York. 
Another portion of the pipeline, which is the one where I was arrested for the civil disobedience action, was in Massachusetts. It's owned by the same company. It's the same pipeline. But the way that they, that they get these through, um, as we've heard about, the regulatory and administrative law is so gamed that they don't count it all as one pipeline so they can separate it and not have to be accountable for the aggregate impact and pollution. These laws are inadequate. Pipelines are almost always approved, no matter the destruction or the fact that they don't benefit the local communities that they run through. Advocates for areas at risk, the Catskills uh, in my case, are compelled to calculate dollars that would be lost in the tourism industry rather than argue about the intrinsic value of the peaceful existence of this beautiful forest. And of course, as Richard Mott mentioned, the Standing Rock Sioux broke through this discourse this year. Water is life, protect the sacred. We are water protectors. I'm really looking forward to hearing Winona LeDuc later tonight on this subject as well. As for the Endangered Species Act, since last January alone, there have been 46 legislative attempts to weaken it, according to the Center for Biological Diversity. One measure specifically wants to allow for economic factors to be weighed in evaluating a species for eligibility. We know what that means. As we talk about the rights of nature, let us not forget the laws of nature. This phrase is not merely a familiar cliche or a metaphor, nor is it alien to American jurisprudential thought. In fact, it is seminal. In the Declaration of Independence in 1776, the founders of the United States wrote that this nation would sever our ties to the colonial power of England in order, quote, to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. It was only after this assertion that they went on to say in words more frequently referenced, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal, that they are endowed by the creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Nature is the one and only legal authority cited in the very first founding sentences of this country. We are all subject to the laws of nature, from the equality of human beings to gravity to the carbon cycle. Yet the norms of the developed world have been built to some degree around fighting against them. Notions of success have been developed by, into and by controlling nature and amassing material goods. We're even encouraged to look much younger than we really are actually part of this. We seem to be demanding the entire earth abandon the notion of natural cycles in favor of some notion of humanity's linear progress. The language around worth and wealth reflect all this. The people living in the top economic brackets of the richest countries are notoriously concerned with the trust funds of their children and grandchildren, yet often unconcerned with the state of the world, the natural world these children will inhabit. If those that fought the estate tax channeled that energy to protect the health of the atmosphere and the oceans that their progeny would one day enjoy and depend on, we might not be facing this existential ecological crisis. The trajectory of materialism over time has also revealed the limits of its ability to make people happy or allow for any real pursuit of happiness, as the case may be. As Pope Francis has written, the constant flood of new consumer goods can baffle the heart and prevent us from cherishing each thing and each moment. The way most of us live now, with cars, television, computers, strip malls, with goods and services manufactured from all over the world, the prolifera proliferation of single-use disposable cups and bags, this wasn't the way our ancestors lived, no matter where they came from. And all, the things, all these things contribute to a mentality that has further alienated us from the cycles of nature. And incidentally, the conditions in which our species evolved. So that it is, of course, natural that it would contribute to epidemics of depression and anxiety, as well as diseases from sedentary lifestyles like obesity. 
Yesterday, I was in Florence, South Carolina, where I have listened to people of different races and backgrounds tell about missing the knowledge and ways of their grandparents who grew their own food, made their own soap, and watched the signs of the birds and animals in order to anticipate changes in the weather. This same group talked about increased cancer rates among them from those living near coal ash dumped in their communities. And they talked about struggling to afford money for medications necessary to deal with these health impacts. The more our culture has been divorced from the land, the more the land is contaminated. The more we have to rely on purchasing goods and services from afar in order to simply survive. We really should change this. Before I close, I just want to mention the case of Flint, Michigan. The government, as in, I know most of us are familiar, but it's worth revisiting for, for a moment. The, the, the government officials, actually an unelected emergency manager, looking to cut costs, switched the water supply from Detroit city water, which comes from Lake Huron and the Detroit River, to supplies drawn from the Flint River, which had been horribly polluted by Ford Motor Company in the 1970s. Predictably, the acidic toxins in this new source of water leached the lead from the pipes. The number of children with elevated lead exposure doubled. Residents reported rashes and hair loss. Fetal deaths increased by 58%. There has been a great deal of focus on Flint. And appropriately, it has been on issues of race and class bias with a focus on the discriminatory way in which these decisions were made, as well as on the immediate need for new pipes. But we should also consider that we could be a society that values the health of a river, the Flint River, over the corporate desire to use it as a dumping ground. And if the Flint River had a right to its health and integrity, the entire tragedy might have been avoided in the first place. We should also consider that fresh water is not scarce in that region. Even now, as residents of Flint still do not have fresh, clean water, Nestle, the world's largest food and beverage company bottles water from the aquifers around them and sells it for quite a profit. In a recent permit application, Nestle asked to pump 210 million gallons of water per year, a 60% increase from the town of Evert, which is a mere two hours away from Flint. And it proposed to, to pay no more than it pays today, which is, brace yourself, $200 a year. I know, it seems not right, but this is, you can, it, this is what, they are seen as providing economic growth. They are not, and, and what is in the ground as groundwater is currently not valued until it is put in plastic and has a price tag on it. So Nestle made $7.4 billion in sales from water in 2016 alone. Reverend William Barber was recently in Flint and declared, when it comes to water, we should be working within the government to make that as cheap as possible. Privatizing that which the Lord created is just wrong. Nestle's absurdly profitable bottling plant, Flint River's absurd volume of pollution, and the shutoffs of Detroit's water for poor people are all connected. The same tragic absurdity characterizes mountaintop removal for coal, fracking in fragile wetlands, clearing of forests for monocropping, and so much more. This is the way we treat the whole ecosystem and disregard the people living in it. Elements of nature that are essential for life are naturally and freely given to us by the earth, and yet they're treated as worthless. If you can put these same elements in a plastic throwaway container and put a price tag on them, though, they're considered valuable. If their intrinsic worth is acknowledged and safeguarded for generations to come, our system should be able to recognize and support that, not disregard it. We are paying too high a price for cheap goods and this version of economic growth. Real wealth is in the abundance of nature shared by the community of life over generations. In order to really create wealth, in order to honor the true meaning of prosperity and to safeguard freedom, we must give legal rights to nature. Of course, recognition and respect for the rights of nature will bring its own jurisprudence, which is already underway. 
From the ordinance in Tamaqua Borough, Pennsylvania, to the Constitution of Ecuador, bold language recognizing nature's right to exist and regenerate has now been written into binding civic documents. There are similar cases in New Zealand, India, Colombia, and lawsuits in many places, among them in Colorado. We are here to learn much more about this exciting field, and I can't wait. There is an expressive function in law with a dynamic of its own, a setting of intentions that will sow seeds and shift thinking in important ways, though this shift may take a while to come to fruition. Widely adopted statement, such as the Declaration on the Rights of Mother Earth, can indeed elevate the planet's needs in much the way that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights elevated the need the needs of human beings after the devastation of the Second World War, and the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is shared and cited in ways that are building influence today. When combined with local ordinances and other practical steps towards jurisprudence, rhetorical work can help lead us to a new way of thinking. It will be an uphill battle. There are powerful forces arrayed against us, but all of the great steps forward in rights thinking were almost unthinkable when they were first imagined. The Declaration of Independence was laughed at in England as unenforceable and illegitimate. The Emancipation Proclamation was only a theory long before it became a fact, and it only applied to places where the United States government had only the most tenuous control. In many ways, these all began as a set of aspirations, but aspirations matter. Just as human comes from the same root as earth, to aspire, comes from the same root as to breathe. I want to end by quoting someone I disagree with. A few weeks ago, John Viola, the president of the National Italian American Foundation, wrote an op-ed for the New York Times, arguing to keep up and respect and honor our statues of Christopher Columbus. He wrote that it was worthwhile to lift up, quote, the values of discovery and risk that are at the heart of the American dream. I disagree with his argument. There is no discovery or risk in lifting up a version of history that demeans whole peoples and cultures, enshrining a decayed and illusory hierarchy over life. But I think he's actually searching for something important on which we might agree. This is the time for a movement that is both new and courageous for the revelation of what might look to some like a new world. The rights of nature comes originally from the wisdom of indigenous peoples, but it also encompasses a dynamic ingenuity that runs deep in all peoples. We have the innovative, explorative spirit to begin to see the great wealth around us as part of a living, breathing reality to be shared in communion. And we also have the grit and the bravery to take the risk to fight for it. Thank you. <laughs>